For today, for the, from the lesson from Genesis, a message I've entitled, The Young and the Restless. There was an article in the newspapers sometimes back about a British husband who walked out on a 38-year marriage because he could not stand his wife obsessively moving the furniture. John Turner filed for divorce, complaining he was sick and tired of his wife Pauline shifting chairs, tables, the television, and anything not fixed to the walls every single day of their married life. Moving furniture about was just something I did, and I always will do, Pauline said. I suppose everybody has their little obsession. I suppose we might term that a little obsession, changing the furniture around every single day. I suspect that would bug your mate after a while. Some of you husbands are thinking, poor man. Some of you wives are thinking, lazy husband. It's rare to read about someone who is addicted to change. Most people are quite resistant to change, particularly in today's rapidly changing world. In fact, many of us find change rather scary. Think of the changes that our society has experienced since 1990, for example. Some have been exhilarating, like the fall of communism, the mapping of the human genome system, and the wiring of our world with the Internet. But some changes have been unnerving, such as the horrifying scourge of terrorism, the rapid spread of AIDS, and now COVID-19. And Stephen Hawking warned that computers are developing so rapidly that they will soon surpass human knowledge. And unless we wire our brains to theirs, computers could take over the world. Computers have already taken over the workplace, leaving us the feeling that before long, we will not be able to keep up. After all, experts tell us that the current generation of people living right now has witnessed and participated in more change than any 10 previous generations combined. You've heard that at present, human knowledge doubles about every two years. Well, it is estimated that knowledge will double every 73 days this year. Half of what you learn today will either change or no longer be relevant in five to seven years. One source noted that there was more information produced in the 30 years between 1965 and 1995 than was produced in the entire 5,000-year period from 3,000 B.C. to 1965. And we wonder, will we be able to adapt? It's like the two older ladies ladies who put up a sign in their little shop. Your patience is appreciated. New electronic cash register. Same old ladies. We understand their predicament. And so for inspiration, we turn back a few thousand years to the story of a man named Abram, or Abraham, as he would later be known. Abraham was a man in his 70s when God spoke to him. Now, that marks him as being rather old in today's world. But consider this. He died when he was 175. So, in a relative sense, we could say that even in his 70s, he was still among the young and the restless. Abraham was living in a very prosperous city, a center of trade and commerce, when God came to him and said, Leave this country and your extended family, and go to a land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and will make your name great. And though all, and through all your families of the earth, you will be blessed. Scripture sums up Abraham's response like this. So Abraham departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him. No argument, no deals. Now, Lord, if you will give me a bigger house in this new land, then I'll know you are with me. Lord, if, if you would give me a sign like a new Mercedes, that would do. None of that. God spoke. Abraham obeyed. 
He took his family and all he owned and headed out toward a new world. Let's begin here. Change happens and we better learn to deal with it. Abraham was not the first person to deal with change and he certainly would not be the last. Change happens. All of us are watching our life situations change daily. Our children are growing up. Friends we know are getting divorced. Jobs require us to move to a new locale. Family members die. New shopping centers grow up where we remember cattle grazing. Change happens. One key to successful living is to learn how to adapt to change. Psychologists maintain that a mentally healthy person can tolerate uncertainty and change. A good example of a person who could not adopt to change was Adolf Hitler. Biographers of Hitler claim that he was fanatically rigid. Hitler wore the same clothes every day until they were virtually falling off. He followed the exact same time schedule every day. He walked his dog at the same time every day. Every day on his walk, he would pick up the exact same piece of wood at the exact same spot and throw it in the exact same direction. He listened to the same pieces of music and watched the same movies over and over. Even the smallest changes were threatening to Hitler. Change happens. And a sign of good mental, emotional, and spiritual health is the ability to adapt to change. Abraham obviously was a man who could adapt to change, to leave a place where he was so secure, to leave his father's house where he knew he would always be taken care of, to make a new start in a hostile environment. Abraham was a man who could inspire us as we cope with a world of change. In fact, not only is it healthy to adapt to change, many of us would be helped if from time to time we would seek out change. Some people change only when they are forced to do so. They like the man who was always in trouble with the law. He went to confession and told his priest, I'm changing my ways, Father. The priest, of course, was happy to hear this and asked, Did you finally see the light, my son? The former troublemaker answered, No, Father, I felt the heat. The only time some people change is when they feel the heat. And that's sad. There are two kinds of change. The kind is thrust upon us, losing a job, having a health crisis, etc. And the kind we choose. We cannot avoid the changes that are thrust on us. They happen. They will always happen. The best way to prepare for them is to learn to adapt. The way we learn to adapt is to move out of our comfort zone occasionally and try something new. Acquire a new skill. Take up a new hobby. Travel somewhere where few people speak your language. Involve yourself in a ministry that is outside your comfort zone. Anytime we try something that we have never tried before, we gain confidence. We push back the limits of our self-perceptions and we grow in our ability to cope with life. Of course, there are reasonable limits to trying new things. You may have heard about the 65-year-old woman who, with the help of a fertility specialist, had a baby. All of her relatives came to visit and meet the newest member of their family. When they asked to see the baby, the new mother said, not yet. A little later, they asked to see the baby again. Again, the mother said, not yet. Finally, they asked, when can we see the baby? And the mother said, when the baby cries. And they asked, why do we have to wait until the baby cries. The 65-year-old mother said, because I forgot where I put it. Perhaps there are reasonable limits on the new experiences we should give ourselves. But it is so sad when people get to the point that they feel they cannot change. Ted Koppel was, had something to say on this subject. He 
visited Valley State Prison for women and interviewed an inmate who said she had little hope of ever getting off drugs. She admitted that when released, she would be back on them as soon as she got out. She was, she said sadly, too old to change. Koppel thought she might be in her late 50s, but she was 38. Age is truly a matter of perspective, he concluded. You've heard the expression that the only difference between a rut and a grave is the size of their dimensions. And there's some truth to that. In order to keep growing, we need to seek out changes in our lives. We need to keep moving forward, lest life push us back. How do we cope with a world of constant change? Well, first of all, we seek out change, small changes, small improvements to help us grow in our confidence and our adaptability. Secondly, we work at keeping our primary relationships strong. We can cope with almost any change in our lives if there are people surrounding us with love. Don't you wonder how Sarah... Abraham's wife dealt with this drastic change God and Abraham subjected her to. To move from the security of a great walled city to become nomads in the desert, to leave the familiarity of family and friends, that required both faith and resilience. If you read the rest of the story in Genesis, you will discover that Abraham was not an ideal husband. He put Sarah at risk more than once. Still, it is obvious that she loved him and stuck by him. I wonder how Abraham and Sarah would fare in today's world, a world in which husband and wife both have careers and in which it is sometimes necessary for each to make sacrifices in behalf of the other. It is absurd that it should always be the wife who compromises. Love requires that both partners adjust to the needs of the other. But many people have discovered that they can adjust to almost any change if they are surrounded by love. Listen, husbands, listen, wives. The best security for your family is not found in your career, not found in your bank account, not found in your stocks and bonds. The best security for your family is found in the maturing and nurturing love that you have for one another. If everything else is stripped away, you can still make it if you love one another. In a world of constant change, we need to keep changing. We need to continually nurture our primary relationships that give life meaning. But there is a relationship more important than any other. It is the relationship we have with God. A rock-steady faith in God is essential in a world where everything else is in flux. God spoke and Abraham obeyed. Abraham could face a new world with confidence and power because he knew God was with him. A certain pastor was leading a revival in an African-American church. Everyone had heard great things about his preaching. But the first night of the revival, the preacher walked into the church and began playing a tune on the piano. Softly, he began singing, I will, I will, I will. Slowly, the congregation picked up on the tune and sang along. Soon, the whole congregation broke out in joyful singing, I will, I will, I will. At that point, the preacher suddenly stopped playing closed his eyes in prayer and announced, Lord, you've heard our answer. Now ask your question. That was Abraham's attitude toward life. Abraham wanted more than anything else in the world to be the man God wanted him to be. And the Lord was with him in all of his life changes Abraham had faced. I hope you want to be the man or woman God means for you to be. If you are, you won't need to worry about what the future holds. There will be changes, but you will not only cope, you will conquer through the power of the father of Abraham, 
Isaac, and Jacob, the father of Jesus of Nazareth, and your father and mine as well. In Jesus' name.